Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today. My name is Scott Sugden, Product and Technology Outreach Manager here at L Acoustics. Today, we've got a great topic all about whether or not you should fly your subwoofers and the myth that flying subwoofers, subwoofers is 6 dB less efficient. Uh, my co-presenter today, the uh, man himself, uh, the most intelligent human being uh, that's named Etienne Cortel that I've ever met. Um, it's uh, the, the one dilemma in life is that he uh, sometimes forgets to unmute his mic, so we'll see how he does today. <laughs> Etienne, thank you for joining us. Okay, what can I say after that? <laughs> Thank you, Scott. Okay, uh, so I'm Director Etienne Cortel, Director of Education and Scientific Outreach uh, at Air Acoustics, uh, and I'm very happy to be here today to talk with you about that, that topic uh, that we have uh, tackled in a scientific publication at the Audio Engineering Society, so the, the convention uh, in New York uh, in 2018 and uh, we'll try to give you a bit uh, more of an idea, a deep dive into that topic and, uh, and explain uh, in quite some details what's the outcome of this study. Thank you. Excellent, thank you. Thank you, Etienne. So today, uh, helping to answer questions live, if you're joining us live in the moderation panel, um, we've got a crack team of experts. Uh, let's start with Team America first. Dan Bowers, uh, thank you for joining us from uh, super exciting uh, Cedarburg, Wisconsin. Dan, how are you doing today? I'm doing very good. We have wonderful cloudy weather and no warmth today, so it's a beautiful day in uh, Wisconsin. And looking forward to this webinar. Subs are always a fun discussion. So thank you, Scott. Thanks, Dan. So Dan's going to help us answer some questions. Uh, heading to almost Team America, Andre Pichette. Andre uh, from Las Vegas, Nevada via Montreal, Canada. Is that correct? Yeah, thank you, Scott. Uh, yeah, uh, so here in Vegas today, we'll hit a record for, uh, we'll have the three digit in temperature, so it means uh, 34 C or 100 F. So hopefully everybody will be safe and healthy. Thank Good. you, Scott. And, and Andre, yeah. your pool is uh, slightly cooler, correct? Yeah, finished to, fin finished to fix it yesterday, so it's all good now. <laughs> all right, excellent, excellent. Thank, thank you, Andre. Yeah. And heading south, uh, uh, Andre will obviously help answer questions in the moderation panel, uh, English, French, and of course, Quebecois. Uh, let's go ahead and flip to Alex Soto in Guadalajara. Alex, how are you today? Hi, Scott. Hi, I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. It's a beautiful day here. We're expecting 32 degrees Celsius, which is uh, really nice. It's around 96 Fahrenheit. Uh, so, and I'm very excited about this webinar. You know, it's 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 very interesting. You know. Our, we're going to clarify, you know, a big myth in regard of subwoofers design. Uh, well, bienvenidos todos. Eh, aquí estamos una vez más para responder sus preguntas en español. Espero disfruten este webinario que va a estar muy, muy interesante en relación a subs colgados versus subs en stack. Espero que lo disfruten. Thank you, Scott. Excellent. Thank you, uh, Alex. Uh, heading east, uh, Sergey. It's good to see you again, Sergey. Everything's well in London, I assume. Um, yeah, weather is back to normal as it should at this time of the year, rainy and cloudy, uh, unfortunately, but uh, looking forward to the summer weather again. Привет всем. Интересная тема сегодня будет. Наслаждайтесь, задавайте вопросы. Excellent. Thank you, Sergey. Oscar, thank you for joining us again. It's been a few weeks since we've seen you on a webinar, Oscar. Um, how is everything in the far, far north? It's very good and we're almost hitting 20 degrees now, so it's hey. uh, it's feeling hopeful. Let's put it that way. Excellent. Yes. Well, well, thank you for joining us, Oscar. Today, uh, you. you're going to help out in the, uh, the moderation as well. Uh, so once again, if you guys have any questions, don't hesitate. Um, the last and the uh, most important uh, member of this team, uh, as always, Francois. Thank you for joining us, Francois. Uh, how is uh, dad and webinar and uh, training duty going? Everything well on your end? Uh, yeah, till now, uh, till now I managed to to handle the, all the the different aspect of this uh, very strange uh, period. But uh, um, yeah, it's been a while since I, I haven't uh, been with you for the webinar uh, sessions. But I'm quite excited with this topic, which is uh, I think for most of us one of the most uh, exciting ones. So I'm going to to be able to answer in uh, in English, but uh, mainly in French. Donc uh, bonjour tout le monde. And we'll see you in the chat for the Q&A. Thank you. Excellent. 
Thanks for joining us, everyone. I uh, really appreciate it. Um, so we're going to get started today talking about subwoofers and whether we have uh, flown or ground stacked in this myth uh, that you lose 6 dB when you ground stack subwoofers. Um, before we go directly into that comparison, I, I think I want to just have a little bit of background on maybe some choices we have from a design perspective of whether to fly or not to fly. Right. So. Um, if you want to fly subwoofers or not to fly subwoofers, there's some things you might consider, right? You might want to be concerned about the weight available for your rigging system. So this might be a reason you don't fly subwoofer is, is ultimately we only have 1000 kilogram total weight and I need to fly my main PA first. That, that might be a rationale or reason why we don't fly a subwoofer. Second thing is going to be something like the number of available rigging points. Um, the picture I have here on screen has a few uh, rigging points. This is a, a giant stadium in, in Dallas, Texas, or just outside of, and there's no issue with the number of rigging points, so we were able to fly the subwoofer. That's great. Um, so that could be a scenario where we choose to not fly subwoofer because of the availability or not of rigging points. Third could be something like sight lines. I, I need to try to get enough subwoofer into the system to achieve the desired performance goals. And when I have enough subwoofer, um, the, the sight lines could be obstructed for the people up front or on the sides. If we put them on the ground, maybe we want to fly them. Maybe the fourth thing to think about is how you would align your system. If I have my subs next to my mains, it makes alignment much easier. So that's maybe something we want to be concerned with. And last and not least is SPL. Uh, we often think of SPL in terms of total power, um, and we'll call that the absolute throw capability of the system, how loud we can get it in the back. That's always the challenge. Um, and with uh, subwoofer, we also want to think about the relative throw. How loud is it going to be for the people in front? If we fly the subs, we can start to think right away we're going to make it less loud for the people in front because they're not right next to them. Um, but what about that lack of, of energy we get from the ground? So these are all the, the basic scenarios we want to think about when we when we start talking about our subwoofer system. So long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, when we used to have sound systems maybe 20, 25 years ago, uh, the subwoofer crossover between the sub and the main was often somewhere between 80 or 100 hertz for large sound systems and potentially higher for smaller sound systems. And so what this means is ultimately the subwoofer was responsible or wholly responsible for effectively two octaves. So it was quite common for the subwoofer to be the primary source of both energy uh, and and frequency response for everything below 100 hertz. And, and this is a very different situation than we're, we're at now, but this was the way it was 20 plus years ago. Second thing to think about, I put on screen here the KS28, that's the sub on the bottom, and above it it's great grandfather, that's the SB218 for those of you who are old enough to remember it. So the KS28 is a double 18 reference design uh, subwoofer and the SB218 is a double 18. They're about the same size externally, give or take a few centimeter. So they're about the same size sub. They have the same driver count with the same driver surface area. And today the KS28 is about 25% less heavy. So it's, it's minus uh, pretty close to 30 kilogram, right? Um, and that's, that's quite a lot. Uh, it's SPL is also, greatly increased, right? So the SPL of the KS28 is much higher than that of the SPL of the SB218. And so this is a big impact on whether or not we fly subwoofers because they're getting lighter and they're getting louder, i.e. it takes less weight to get to the same performance. An interesting metric here is if you think of SPL per kilogram, the difference between these two is close to 9 dB. With the weight reduction and the SPL increase, it's almost a 9 dB swing between the two. That's, that's quite a lot. The second thing is by the mid 90s, it was possible to fly subwoofers. Um, we had simple rigging systems. It was like a chain with clips on the side of it. Um, depending on the manufacturer, the, the brand of speaker, we had pretty similar concepts, pretty simplified systems for flying subwoofer. Um, really not designed for the needs of say touring applications or mobile deployments um, versus today from almost every manufacturer, including L Acoustics, we have very complete rigging systems for flying subwoofers. Integrated rigging, 
uh, the KS28, an example, I actually put some behind me so you guys can see it. I have a nice chariot where you can ride them three or four high, which makes it fast and easy to deploy. So it's no longer a challenge of getting them in the air. The question is whether or not you want to get them in the air. Another big change that's happened over the last decade plus or 10 years plus is from the aspect of the main source or the, the main PA. Um, across the entire industry, we've seen the main PA you provide more and more of the functional bandwidth of the system. In the case of K1 or K2, they're full range sources that go down to 35 hertz on their own. So the need for the subwoofer to be the sole provider of that energy in the low is greatly diminished. What we see now is that the subwoofer is really just giving a limited bandwidth extension. It's taking our system response from, say, 35 hertz down to 25 hertz. But more importantly, it's increasing the power. So it's giving you a, an increased power down in that low frequency bandwidth. And so the question of to fly or not to fly your subwoofer is a bit different than it was, say, 20 years ago. Let's think about the last thing, alignment. So when we have the subs on the ground, the challenge we run into is we have two distinct arrivals from your main PA versus your sub. And in that last slide, we talked about the fact that the main PA and the sub are, are doing different things than they were 15 or 20 years ago. We, it, it introduces a new set of problems. And that challenge is finding the best compromise between the two alignments um, versus when they're flown, especially adjacent to the main PA, we have a stable alignment. The two arrive at a very similar time together in most of the audience. So let's think about this lastly in terms of SPL. When we have the subs on the ground, we of course get the ground coupling effect, right? So when the sub is on the ground, I get the energy from the sub and I get the energy from its reflection on the ground. And that reflection on the ground gives us plus six dB. It's as if we had twice as many subs. The downside of the subs on the ground is the people up front get a, a lot of SPL. It really builds up for those people in front. When I fly the subs, of course, up high, the people who are in the front are much further away from the subs in the front, so it's not as loud for them. But we don't have the same ground coupling, right? There's half as efficient as they are when the subs are in the air. At least that's the myth that the subs flown versus the subs on the ground lose 6 dB. So is it worth flying the subs if we have half as much power? That's the myth. And Etienne, what do you have to say about that myth? So, yeah, in order to attack that myth, uh, I think we started by a very basic measurement, and that's something that we are going to see here. Uh, so we took a KS28 in our R&D facilities uh, in Marcoussi near Paris, put it on the ground, I've flown it like at three meter height and took a set of measurements by comparing what we get uh, on the floor. So putting the microphone directly on the floor at a seated height, which would be about 1.2 meter where we have the ears when we are seated and at a standing height of about 1.6 meter. And, what's, and that's exactly what you are seeing like in this graph is that the outcome of that measurement is that the power loss is actually quite negligible. And the reason for that is obviously that the ground is not strictly disappearing uh, when you're flying the sub, like uh, it's still there, it's still contributing. So we still have that mirror and it's still contributing to the total energy. When we said that, we've only measured one point. And what we want to look into uh, for more details about all of that is what happens over the audience. So how are we going to distribute that energy, uh, that SPL, and how we can really evaluate the efficiency, what's the efficiency of a subwoofer configuration? So not only one, like uh, there it's only one subwoofer, but we know that we'll, we are going to use several of these in different type of configuration, left tracked, uh, arc sub, uh, many different scenario and we are going to look into that and with unified metrics so trying to use always the same kind of metrics we are going to check for efficiency and distribution of energy 
And in order to check that, actually, it's something that you can do very easily, uh, even in some vision. And that's something that Scott is going to show you right away. Uh, so Etienne, that's really interesting. So the myth is when I fly the sub, I lose 6 dB of output, right? Um, and to test that, we just simply did a measurement real quick at the test facility at L Acoustics and, and see if we can measure that exact result. And of course we didn't, we, what we found was flying the sub didn't change greatly the output. And let's, let's think about that briefly here and let's see what we can learn from SoundVision. Uh, so this is a SoundVision file I've created. This is in SoundVision version 3.1.15, uh, I think it is, 1.5, pardon me, that came out uh, just, uh, just the other day. So uh, uh, you guys can download that on our website. Uh, feel free to, to go get that. Um, I've also created this file. It's available for download. Uh, one of the moderators will post it right now in the Q&A, so feel free to download that, that now. If you're on YouTube, you can actually download this. It's in the uh, the, the, the YouTube notes uh, right below the presentation here, the, the video. So please download this file if you want to play along at home. So what I have to start with is pretty simple. I have a ground stack of four KS-28. I have it on a little ground plane here. So it's just a surface that goes out, uh, say, 100 meters or so. Um, and I've got it modeled from 25 hertz to 100 hertz. I've activated subwoofer mode on and we're looking at a pretty broad SPL range. So this is a 6 dB per color step. So it's just really easily to see 6 dB variations. And what we see here is is exactly the problem. If the subs on the ground, it's really loud in the front and it's a lot less loud in the back. So this has so much absolute throw energy to the back, um, but it has a pretty significant buildup, which makes it bad in terms of relative throw. So the difference across the audience is pretty severe. Um, this ground plane, uh, we can simulate having a reflection. So sound vision itself does not directly model reflections. However, with something like a subwoofer, it's pretty easy to turn on another stack below ground. So you can actually mirror your subs in the vertical direction if you'd like. And I have a second set of subs on the ground, but it didn't change what I'm seeing. And that's because sound vision also treats a surface as something that will obscure or block the transmission of sound. And so it's actually shadowed. So we can't see that sub under the ground there. So let me just go ahead and activate this guy here. So I've got a little slice where we can see the energy from the top sub here propagating. And I'm gonna make my mirror translucent. We can see through my ground there. Once again, the sub is not going through until I hide it. And now what's really neat is this is just our top stack of subwoofer and let us unmute the bottom stack and we see that we've gained energy so we can actually see the reflected energy from the ground and how it's going to affect the spl across the audience and let me hide that again and remember this is a 6 db change this green is a 6 db range this green is another 6 db range when i unmute that we're changing color here but the the pattern is the same. We're just getting 6 dB louder. So we're adding that 6 dB of ground coupling that, that we always talk about. I've got the exact same thing here, but I've done it with a flown sub stack. So here's our flown sub across the audience. And if we don't think about the ground reflection first, and we compare my flown sub here versus my ground sub, we'll see that the back of the audience is about the same. And that makes sense because we're the same distance from this ground stack sub as we are from this flown sub stack. So the same distance away without talking about any reflections or any loading effects. We're at the same SPL in the back. That's pretty neat. And of course, let me hide that real quick. I can make a virtual copy of it under the ground, which is equidistant from my mirror. Let's see my mirror real quick there again. So there it is, there's my reflected virtual source. And let me unmute that guy and see what happens in the back. So in the back of the venue with these two subs, it's this green color here. And let's take a look at that, how that compares to our ground stack subs. It's the same. In the back of the venue, it's the same. And we can see that in some vision because we have both the original or the real arrival and we have the virtual or the reflected arrival from this solid floor. But in front, we have something different. So in front, we actually have a bit of a diminished buildup. 
So what I can see here is with the ground stack, it's white. So it's above 130 dB from 25 to 100 here. That's pretty loud. With the flown, it's orange only. So it's not exceeding 124. In fact, up at ear level, it's even not exceeding 118. It's pretty neat. So this works really well for any flat object or solid surface that's on a, a flat plane or even a slope. So imagine this as a festival, imagine this as a, a, the floor of anything. But what happens if we, of course, put, say, a bleacher section in the back? And this is where we can start to see a difference. So imagine this as a transparent or acoustically transparent bleacher. So this would be a grandstand maybe at a stadium that's transparent where, where the ground is far below. And now if we look at the flown subs and the mirror versus the ground stack subs, we see that there is a bit of a difference. And that difference is the arrival time of the two is not exactly the same, and we're starting to see a problem. Okay, so the last thing we can do here, which is really fun, is I've actually created the rest of this slice. And the reason I like this is if I were to look at this just right, it starts to look a lot like what a stereo sound system looks like. So if I fly my subs and let's hide those just to make it obvious, this is a left and right sub stack, if you will, or it's a flown and it's mirror. And this line right down the middle is the center aisle and the ground. So flown subs function a lot like a stereo sub, except for because you're on a hard surface, you're always in the middle of them. You're always in the middle, which gives you that, that buildup of energy. But I, I don't think that's the full picture, is it, Etienne? Actually, that's the, the start of the picture, but that tells already quite a lot. And uh, I think uh, what we're seeing there is that with the bleacher, so as you, what you were saying is transparent, we can say it's acoustically transparent, and that's anything that would be typically metallic structures or whatever, because compared to a wavelength, uh, it's basically uh, nothing. So uh, what we're going to see as a reflection is primarily what comes from the concrete floor, which is often like on which the bleacher is standing. And that's what we are going to get. So we'll get a little bit diminish of energy towards the end of a bleacher. And it's probably something we can live with if we don't have to blow uh, completely the, the first part of the audience. So there's always like a bit of a compromise balance that you have to create between these situations, but uh, it's it's actually possible to, to check that already in Sound Vision. In Sound Vision, we really get that nicely that we can test for one situation, uh, but what we wanted to do also in this article is to try to be, let's say, a bit more systematic. So test more situations, being able to draw more conclusions. And uh, that's where, so where I need to, uh, Share your screen. To take over. <laughs> I'm getting there, sorry. Okay, so I'll get, I'll take over. That's good. Yep, yep. And uh, that's where we see that uh, actually we get uh, this, uh, this first uh, graph that we were creating for, the, for that article was to look at what happens on the ground level. So not even thinking of a standing or seated audience in terms of pure level reduction compared to a ground stack. So that's why what we are seeing there in this graph is primarily yellow, which in this color scheme, like uh, this yellow is zero to minus three dB. We are seeing mostly values that are close to zero because we're comparing at any distance to what we would get with a ground stack by varying the subwoofer height. So that's something you should see there. The subwoofer height is varying. The listening distance is varying. And what we see is that at the ground level, like pretty much everything, so, uh, even for pretty high subwoofers, so even at a 12 meter high subwoofer, we see that starting from something like 20, 25 uh, meters there, so 24 meters, we will have only a reduction of minus one dB. So it's, uh, it's already quite small. So at large distances, level of flown and ground stacks are the same at the ground level. And what if we look at the standing level? What's interesting is that it's still fairly similar. So instead of, uh, of energy, what we gain is just that this line of minus one dB is getting further back. So when we are considering a standing 
or a seated audience. It will be quite similar, but just we need to get a little bit further in distance to regain the full amount of energy that we would get from a, from a ground stack subwoofer. Okay, and for that, in order to make like that, uh, let's say a little bit more uh, easy to remember, there's a quite uh, there's something quite simple we can apply uh, is what we've called the distance to height efficiency ratio, which will tell you the distance, the listening distance uh, ratio at which you will recover the same level of energy for a flown subwoofer than for a ground stack subwoofer. So if you're on the ground, it's fairly simple. You have to multiply the height of the subwoofer by a factor of two. And then if your subwoofer is, let's say, at five meters, starting from 10 meters away from the subwoofer, you will recover the full energy of your subwoofer as if it would be on the floor at the distance. When you have a seated audience, the factor goes up to four. So we add this five meter high height, we have to go at 20 meters from the subwoofer to recover the full energy. And then when we're standing, then we're talking about a factor of five. So from this five meter uh, of height of subwoofer, we have to go to 25 meters in distance to recover the full energy. And that's what we can see in these original graphs. So that's this line that we have there, this factor two. So this is the ground level the original ground level that we had and this is the standing situation where we had people standing and we consider that they have their ears at 1.6 meters high and we see that this line gets us a little bit further back so etienne uh um myth busted we can go home now right there's nothing more no there's more oh, okay <laughs> A little more. So uh, two interpretations of that, because that has really some clear applications, is the minimum distance at which the full energy is obtained for a given subwoofer height. So it will give you that ID, like uh, where do I need to be to regain that full efficiency? Or uh, in a design scenario, it will give you the maximum height at which you should place the subwoofer to get the full energy of the sub in a given venue. So if you have a venue that's typically like, a, I don't know, 25 meters deep and you have a standing audience, that means that this factor five, so you have to put your subwoofer at most at five meters if you want to regain the full energy. And if the audience is flat, obviously. Okay, so now what happens when we have more than one subwoofer? So we are looking into an array. An array does not behave exactly the same as if we would have only one subwoofer. And that's a good example of a simple configuration of subwoofer we want to, uh, we want to account for. And that will give us like a, a possibility to, uh, let's say, introduce some objective uh, metrics to be able to, uh, to, to judge on this type of configurations. So instead of looking only at one, let's say, simple example, we decided to go to typical configurations of two, four, eight, and 16 subwoofers. So each time we double the amount of subwoofers that would fit into audience dimensions that are of typical sizes. So two subwoofers, we would consider a small audience of 15 by 20 meters a medium audience of 30 by 40 meters with four subwoofers, a big audience of 45 by 60 meters with eight subwoofers, and a very large audience of 60 by 80 meters with 16 subwoofers. So it gives us like typical, let's say, application scenario of, uh, of this type of configurations. And what we were using in the study was uh, actually that we're computing the pressure in the audience and we are there also adding something about uh, that that's estimating the baffling effect from the fact that we have a bigger object. So before we had only one single subwoofer and when we build a larger object, larger baffle, we are going to concentrate also a bit more energy towards the front. And that's also something that breaks a little when you move like your subwoofer away from the floor you may break that baffle, but we're going to see it's not like a, a big, big, big difference. 
So, and for that, we model the KS28 like uh, in a 12 octave resolution and 30 to 80 hertz. Okay, and the quality indicators we are going to look into because that's uh, that's quite important is one which will enable us to evaluate the far field, what we say relative efficiency, because what we want to check uh, in that uh, scenario is how much dB we gained compared to one ground stacked subwoofer in the same area. So it's basically the return on investment. I could have put only one subwoofer, but I decided to put more. How much more energy, how much more benefit am I going to get? Okay. And for that, we are going to look into the average SPL in the rear portion of the audience. So that's the black line over there we're seeing where we are actually, uh, it corresponds to 25% of the rear portion of the audience. So what you would expect from that return uh, of invest on investment of adding more subwoofers in the far field is typically to gain 6 dB per doubling of the number of subwoofer. And that's what we're going to look into. And the second measure will be quite similar to measures we use, for example, in ELISA, when we want to check for SPL distribution. When we look into nine, the 95% uh, intervals, again, the median SPL over the entire audience area. So we are looking into the difference between almost maximum and almost minimum SPL in the audience which will give us an idea of how much like front to back ratio we're going to have on how much like level differences we're going to experience in the audience. And that's quite an important measure to see how homogeneous is our energy distribution. So the next thing for the vertical arrays is this. So as I said, like in terms of efficiency, what we are expecting is pretty much that each time we double the amount of subwoofer, we should get uh, an additional 6 dB uh, per doubling those, those, the, those number of subwoofer. And what we can see there in this graph is that like for the different configurations, so obviously depending on the number of subwoofers versus like uh, room size, we didn't go as high. So for example, uh, for the two subwoofer configuration, we stopped fairly early at three meters high. For four subwoofers, we stopped at 4.8, something like that, a little bit around 6.3 meters for eight and up to uh, eight meters for the, for the 16 subwoofer. And when we talk about this height, that's actually the height from the bottom of the array, not from the center of the array. That's why we go down to zero, obviously. Each line would compare, so the efficiency, this measure of efficiency at the rear end of the audience against one ground stack sub. And what we see is that when we raise the sub, so here, uh, by doubling the number of sub, we get something on the ground, something slightly higher than 6 dB. And we, when we raise the sub and when we fly it, we lose a slight little bit of energy at the beginning because of this baffling effect, which is true for small number of subs, not true for the higher number of subs. And we lose a very tiny bit of energy when we fly them. Okay. And what we see is that for all the configurations, so 2, 4, 8, and 16, we're always more than 6 dB higher per doubling of number of subs, whether being on the ground or whether being flown. So by being flown, we don't lose energy and we remain quite, let's say, in typical configuration with uh, 8 or, uh, or 4, uh, sorry, 8 or more subs, like we will be quite good, uh, so we remain very good when we fly. So Etienne, you're, uh, you're yep. making energy out of thin air, correct? So if we put subs next to each other, we get more energy than we started with? Something like that, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> the, benefit uh, is, the benefit is really because of this baffling effect. 
So the fact that we get more energy than what we expect as a return is really because of a baffling effect. And that's what we are seeing actually with a small number of sub is that there is a benefit of build up, slight benefit of build up there, but we reach kind of a plateau as soon as we have uh, eight subs together. And eight subs and eight subs flown. Um, so that's that's really quite interesting. So uh, uh, it doesn't increase as you get bigger than about eight subs, and you can even see that in your your smaller models that 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 happens. So a small stack of subs gets a benefit of the baffle from the ground. Yeah. Uh, but uh, a, a bigger stack gets negligible benefit from the baffle from the ground, and in the air, then that that's quite comparable. Uh, yeah. In that scenario. Cool. And all in all, like we are talking about one dB, so uh, in terms of pure efficiency, so that's quite limited compared to the huge difference we'll get in SPL distribution. Understood. And, and that's our next criteria, so that's what we're we are going to look uh, into. And there we measure this uh, distribution of energy for each of the configurations, so that's what we see uh, in this graph is that for two subs, so we always start like uh, for most configuration around 15 dB of distribution. So that means like uh, we have more than 15 dB level difference between the front and the back typically, which is quite a lot, uh, considering that typically for line source, we aim at something like 6 dB front to back when we have a good design. And what we would want in order to maintain like a good tonal balance as well is that from the sub itself, we have about the same type. So when we say 6 dB, it's primarily higher frequencies. In lower frequencies, we know it's a bit more, but we still have a directive uh, point source behavior. Uh, so we have this uh, ability to limit uh, the SPL difference and we would want to have about the same kind of energy distribution with the sub to maintain that tunnel balance. So what we see is that uh, for all of these configurations, it's actually quite easy to, by flying them, to reduce that distribution below 10 dB, and even going down almost to 5 dB for the flown uh, configuration of 16 sub at quite some height. So we can end up with quite some drastic uh, reduction in distribution, which end up in a much more homogeneous distribution of SPL. What happens when we go for, let's say, more than one subwoofer, but not only this vertical line, which is a bit like, it might be one component of a configuration, but uh, it's not the most usual configuration. So what we wanted to check is what happens with Basically, that vertical line could be equivalent to there what we see as a flown uh, central array. So that's one of the reference configurations we have. We could compare that to a more typical scenario of a flown left-right left -right configuration. So there we see like the left-right configuration of the line sources, so the main system. There we see the sub. And we see for each like the sub configuration that's below. So there I'm showing an example with eight subs, which is either eight as an array, two times four as a flown left right array, two times four as a matrix uh, below the, the flown line sources. What we call an arc compact there, which is a line of subwoofers that are touching each other which is typically what you have uh, in the arc sub uh, scenario of sound vision, where we leave the subs like close together. And maybe a bit more usual situation of an arc wide, where the subs would be distributed all along uh, the width of the stage. And for that, like for each of the rooms we were looking into, so remember like there was the small, medium, uh, big and very large room. Uh, we have stage sizes that vary as well. And we have this equivalent number of subs which are distributed in all of these configurations. So that gives us the ability with a varying number of subs to compare them in a realistic scenario over all of these typical uh, subwoofer configurations 
against each other and with these metrics that we have introduced. So the efficiency for the far end towards the end of the audience and the distribution of SPL within the audience. For ArcSub, just a little bit of focus on how we uh, actually set up that ArcSub. So uh, that's something you can see uh, in this figure. An ArcSub is a combination of a physical configuration, so a line of, uh, of sources, and then additional delays uh, that we are using uh, in order to uh, uh, in order to uh, to adjust like uh, the directivity pattern of the sub. And what I'm seeing there is that most probably my graph is reversed <laughs> because the further distance uh, I would say is uh, is slightly incorrect. So uh, uh, no, actually that's correct. Sorry, sorry about that. I'm being confused there. So actually because of physical constraints and the size of the KS28, the arc wide for 16 and the arc compact for 16 are the same in this configuration because just giving the size uh, the uh, the width of the KS28, when you put 16 of them together, you end up with the width of 20 meters that we set for that stage. So in the end, we would get the same number. Uh, we would get the same number, the same configuration. And what we see is typically for the wide, uh, we're going to have slightly bigger delays for the same number of subs than the compact and the compact actually uh, is uh, is uh, is going to give about the same type of coverage so that was the the goal when we are setting those delays is to say with this configuration the compact or the wide we want to achieve the same coverage the same type of distribution of energy especially to the sides because that's where we have to put the delays uh, because that configuration would be too directive in a wider audience, as we've said. And uh, actually, those delays were obtained with the new algorithm that was later made available uh, in uh, SunVision version 3.1, which uses delays only and no gain. And uh, so we, when we set those delays, we wanted to have kind of a balance where we maximize the energy, the efficiency, and minimize the distribution uh, of, uh, of SPL, so to have something as homogeneous as possible in the audience. So what, what do we get in terms of efficiency? So when we look at this graph, so this graph will take, will tell us like the amount, uh, the, basically the efficiency of the different configurations. And what it tells us is that especially the flown uh, central configuration is pretty much always the most efficient configuration. So that's the one where we have this one vertical line uh, in the middle that gets higher up always. Okay, when we compare to again one sub on the ground, like that's the one that will give us always the best return uh, of an investment. Okay, and what we can see is that for smaller configurations, uh, so two and four subs, the arc compact, so where we have all the sub packed together in the middle, is actually quite good. So it gives us quite good return on investment compared to the uh, compared to a flown central. By looking at this graph, it's a little bit trickier to, uh, to, to explain a little bit the, the difference with the others. We see that the flown central is really high up, but we've made a slightly different view in order to compare it to, let's say, a baseline, which is uh, which can be considered as the reference, would be the ground stacked LR, where we have a matrix of left and right subs on the ground. So that's what we've done in the next graph, is we look at this efficiency, but now against uh, the ground LR. So we see that ground LR is actually this red curve, it's all zeros there. OK, and that gives us uh, a good way also to compare the ground LR against a typical like similar configuration, which is the flown LR. So we have the same amount of subwoofers, but we fly them and put them next uh, to the main system. And what we see there is that for a small number of subwoofers, so one per side or two per side, we lose a bit of energy compared to the ground LR. 
but when we increase a bit the number of subs, we are getting very, very close. So as soon as we have two times four or even two times eight, we are very close to what we would have with the ground LR configuration. Okay. And when we look at the arc compact, uh, actually, uh, we see that the arc compact is actually quite good for a fairly low number of subwoofers. So when we go to up to eight, uh, we have something that gets fairly efficient. So it's 2 dB above uh, the ground LR, and it's actually more efficient than the arc wide and for quite, uh, for quite a bit. Okay, and again, like the arc wide and the arc compact have the same results for 16 subs because they are the same configuration ultimately. Okay, uh, now when we look at the arc wide on its own, what we see is that the arc wide is getting less and less efficient as we increase the number of subs because we have to put quite a bit of delays to be able to create that directivity, to open up the directivity pattern and to be and by doing so like we lose energy uh, in the in the far end. So when we compare it to the flown center, it's actually, we actually by flying the subs in that configuration, we don't lose 6 dB, we gain 6 dB because we are 6 dB more efficient at the distance for 16 subs and even almost for eight than what we are with the arc wide. So it's actually even beneficial in terms of, uh, of on the return of investment when you compare to that usual situation of an arc wide on the ground by flying the subs we gain quite a lot of energy so etienne is this where i can use my pool analogy is this the a good time for it uh, yeah if you want to yeah so the way i always think of subwoofer is uh, uh if uh, dan bowers myself and uh, francois and sergey and oscar all jumped in the pool uh, holding hands at the same time at the same place we would make one giant wave and a sub arc is if the five or six of us jumped in the pool in slightly different places at slightly different times. If we timed it perfectly, we could create one really nice wave that kind of looked like that original, all of us at the same time, but it wouldn't have nearly the same power, would it? And so if we can put all all the, pardon my, pardon my English, all the fat kids jumping in the pool at the same place, we'll get one big wave versus if we spread out across the side of the pool and jump in at slightly different places in slightly different times. And so if the ultimate goal is the most homogeneous and efficient output, it's pretty obvious in the graph that just flying them in the center is going to get you there faster and better than spreading them out on the ground. And in your graph here, of course, your 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 logic, the arc wide uh, ran into a physical constraint. But if you were to space it out even more, it looks like that graph would continue to go down even further, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah, it would be uh, a bit of a consequence. I mean, like uh, the problem is the bigger is the arc, the more it gets directive. So if you want to redistribute that energy to a side, as you often have to, because the audience will expand uh, to wider situation, especially in festivals and so on, like the, the audience area can be extremely wide, you still have to carry some energy and you have to put those delays or you have to put even more subs and space them and then it's a, it's a, it's a massive amount of, uh, of PA that you have to deploy. Okay, so let's move on because uh, we have still quite a few things to talk about. Uh, so uh, actually what I wanted to touch on now is uh, this aspect of distribution of energy. And it's quite good to look also what gives us like the front central configuration. And what we see is uh, actually there is those maps. Uh, I'm going to explain a bit what we are going to see in those maps because we are going to have the same in different configurations is that we've removed the average energy that we found at the back. So you'll see that at the back on average, it will be always around zero dB. And we are, because we are only interested in these graphs to look into the distribution of energy over the audience, so the different uh, levels that we are going to experience. And what we see is that obviously the front central, we have one line, it's getting to be like very, very homogeneous. And we have a very limited front to back uh, level difference. So we are in the range of six, nine dBs uh, for this configuration of eight subs. 
Obviously, when we look into uh, the ground stack LR and the flow LR, we are going to find back that usual pattern that we all know of. And uh, in the ground LR, we are going to have actually two problems that are going to uh, go uh, together, let's say, is that uh, we have level disparity or SPL disparity due to the fact that we are both interference. So we have two sources that are combining like uh, in different ways at different portions of the audience. That's why we have excess of energy in the center and we have less energy, let's say, to a site. Uh, and we are going as well to have some excess of level in the near field because we have we are ground stacked. So we have kind of the two that are combining together and it's not a very favorable solution. When we are flying the, the subs in left right, what we're seeing is that we still have this excess of energy in front and this pattern, obviously, because it's going to be there. We still have two sources that are being to be interference. But what we see is that the excess of level uh, in, the, in the proximity is far less. And that's actually quite good uh, if you don't want to blow away uh, the people in, uh, in the front. When we look at uh, the arc compact and arc wide, that's where we see that actually for uh, there we are only showing the figures for eight subs, but for the other uh, actually configurations, it could be quite similar. Is that we're seeing that the level distribution is quite similar between the two. So we might be uh, having a little bit more energy to a side with the wide than with the compact. Uh, same thing, like we have a bit more uh, in the center uh, there in the, in the very, very proximity with the compact than with the white, but notice as well that the white gives more energy to more to the sides. So to more positions to the sides, you will have really excess of energy. And we have always to remember that if we have to compare the two, uh, the compact is 3.5 dB more efficient uh, than the wide. So we have a big uh, benefit in terms of efficiency. So that means we need to put almost 50% more subs uh, in the wide configuration than in the compact to reach the same SPL at the far end of the audience. And now when we look like all these configurations together, so we get pretty much like uh, what we discussed before, is that the flown central obviously, as it's not interferent and it's flown, gets the best score ever uh, in terms of distribution. So we see that it's largely different to all the other configurations. We see that the arc compact and the arc wide have excess of level in proximity, so they have a far higher level and it doesn't get much better when we get more subs. So it's not by adding subs, uh, adding positions uh, that we are going to have a, a, a better distribution of energy relatively to the size of the audience, obviously. And what we see is that the flow in LR, it's still interference, so it's still quite high in terms of distribution of energy because we get some low levels and higher levels, but it's quite lower than the Grand LR, and that's true for all configurations, and it gets even more true, even more so in, uh, with, uh, with higher number of, uh, of subwoofers. And what we see even is that 16 subwoofers, so two times eight uh, in a flow LR, typically uh, the flow LR has the same results as the arc. So there's no obvious benefit in terms of energy distribution overall of using an arc sub, over a flown left right for higher number of subs. And as you can imagine, the subs being very close to the PA, they are much easier to align, obviously. Uh, okay, and the last thing, uh, so I already spoiled it <laughs> pretty much, sorry about that. Uh, the, so for the flown left right, we're better than ground LR and we're similar to the arc compact and arc wide. Uh, so, uh, so yeah. It's, uh, it's quite a good, uh, it can be quite a good option when alignment is also a, a topic. So what are the conclusions? Uh, so we can say that flown subwoofer configurations are not less efficient than ground stacked. I think that should be obvious uh, for now. 
Uh, there we are talking about like flat areas. So flat areas can be uh, stalls, can be uh, like an open air configuration that can be also a tilted audience on a concrete floor as you can have in many amphitheaters. So in many, many uh, different type of situations it's going to apply. And it's only when you have bleachers that you can start to have like some loss in the upper part or some very specific configuration of tribunes. But as a general fact, we can't claim that flown subwoofers are less efficient than ground stacked. And actually, from what we saw, and when we don't only talk about one subwoofer, but when we talk about typical configuration of subwoofer, we see that it's almost quite the opposite, where we get up to 6 dB uh, more efficiency for a flown central configuration than for the, an arc wide with the same coverage, so with the same coverage of the audience. And when we talk about subwoofer system evaluation, I think that's, uh, that's also an important fact to remember is that we can't really talk about the energy, the average energy over the audience, but we have to talk as for line sources in terms of absolute throw, what we are going to get at the far end of the audience and relative throw, so the front to back SPL in the venue, because that's quite critical uh, to a tonal balance to be able that the sub combines well with the line source and creates a, an overall like a, an homogeneous tonal balance over the venue and that's critical also for our auditory ears because if we have far uh, a huge excess of energy in the front it can be damaging to the ears of the listeners so less spl at the front that's just what i said is desirable and that's typically uh, what we can avoid with flown subs. So we know there are challenges uh, with flown subs, like uh, in terms of constraints, like uh, practical constraints, but we see that there is uh, actually quite a lot of benefits also from that. Scott, is there anything else you wanted to add on that front? <laughs> no, I, I think um, we, we talked about a lot of, let's say, complex uh, thoughts, this whole idea of absolute throw, which is the the amount of total energy we can deliver in the back of the audience versus relative throw, which is how we think about the distribution of that energy across the audience. You know, it, it really makes me think a lot of how a line source array works. And, and ultimately, our goal is to make it not throw better to the back because that's a fixed function of how much you have in, in your deployment, but make it throw less good to the front, right? So if there's a way we can attenuate the front because of the design, then we'll get a better overall average um, and, and that's that's the way I always think of it is how do we throw less good to the front? Um, there, there seem to be a, a number of different questions uh, um, uh, related on different topics. Um, I saw someone ask a question of whether or not you can uh, fly an arc subarray. Uh, sure, if you've got 16 bumpers and you've got a truss, why not? Um, but uh, remember that the, the mono block flown <coughs> versus the arc sub right, will have the same effect whether it's on the ground or in the air in that sense. So you're still going to lose that 60 dB output. So if you're just trying to get good coverage, why not just fly a big mono block, right, Etin? Yeah, I think I can only uh, support that fact. And uh, we'll still get all the issues also of uh, alignment that we get uh, from um, from an arc uh, with the main PA. So um, yeah. Yep. Yeah, no, nothing there. No you, you know, yeah. You know, I'm going to set you up for this really good at the end. There's a lot of questions of maybe like end fire or cardioid or directivity scenarios. You know, maybe we yeah. should talk about that someday. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, so uh, actually that's uh, something we wanted to expand on, but uh, that's too many topics that we could have put in one uh, in one webinar. So there's going to be more. Uh, actually, what we want to do is to start a bit of series of, uh, of webinar on this topic. And one of the next topics we're going to look into is typically the directivity control. So we have uh, different type of options for directivity control uh, in our portfolio, and that will be uh, one webinar, one next uh, iteration. We don't have the date yet, but uh, I think it's going to be uh, in, uh, soon. How about soon? Weeks. Yeah, soon, soon, let's say soon. Uh, in weeks uh, for, time. For those of you who used to L acoustics, we'll say the month, but not the year. How about that? Yeah. Um, so definitely. Okay. Um, Definitely as well, that's a topic that 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 uh, the question that came up a few times. I also saw a couple of questions about alignment. We didn't talk at all today about the alignment yeah. with the mains. Um, I, I think that's a really important topic because often we we treat our subwoofers as this 
discretion or this uh, individual source when really we need to think about how it integrates with the main. So that's a topic we're going to get to as well over the coming yeah. weeks. Uh, let's leave it so at that. There's been, uh, there's been already uh, a few uh, webinars where we touched on that around calibration with M1 because uh, I mean calibration overall because that's a very important topic about the measurement quality also uh, talking about where you want to align to uh, to have something uh, to have an idea of what it does for the audience uh, but that's a topic that deserves uh, a bit more than that so that will be definitely uh, another topic for webinar and we know this typical, let's say, like a uh, couple configuration, uh, this separated in vertical, separated horizontal and vertical, and sometimes only horizontal. But that's when we are talking about like a left right system. But we have also to think that uh, as a main system, as a main PA, we may have different type of configurations and alignment has to be fought along those lines. And uh, when we have like uh, uh, an ELISA system and especially a focus uh, system for ELISA, this central line, this central configuration that we saw has quite a lot of benefits uh, naturally comes up because we are going to have most of the low frequency energy uh, to be uh, available through uh, the central PA the central clusters that we have there in Elisa, and it's quite natural to think that we're going to put our subs uh, in this area as well. And then um, that's that's really cool. So I can't wait to get deeper into that conversation. Um, someone had a question. It was a good one. Uh, obviously, all of our um, modeling in this AES paper was done in a theoretical perfect reflective place. Um, Etienne, uh, we don't do shows on a perfectly reflective uh, place. We we uh, generally want to have thousands of people there. Um, I'm assuming mm -hmm. that impacts the quality of the sound. I'm assuming that impacts a lot of things. What do we what do we know about that? Yeah, yeah. So uh, actually, there are several points. So uh, the perfectly reflective world uh, we know doesn't exist. Although for low frequencies, like surfaces are often fairly reflective. So uh, when we are talking open air scenario, like we are fairly close at low frequencies or even like any type of uh, large room or, uh, or open air and fit theater, we are very close to what we've talked about today. However, there's one fact we didn't talk about is uh, the presence of the audience. And uh, we know that this is going to affect uh, the low end, uh, the sub low frequencies of the system. So uh, typically, like we know that uh, this is going to, uh, to change a little bit uh, or even quite drastically in some situations, the frequency response of the system. And that's something that often you have to uh, actually account for in a, in a live scenario. So when the show starts where it's getting a bit more difficult to perform measurements, and uh, actually there's more to that. Uh, so uh, I know there's, there are some active discussions uh, about uh, how it's going to affect also the, the propagation of the sound. So the, the speed of sound uh, is going to be modified also uh, from the audience perspective, especially when subs are on the ground where the sub, basically the sub, the low frequency energy has to go through uh, the audience and it's going to be slowed down and uh, what uh, is interesting is to check like uh, relatively to the main what's going to happen and we have ongoing studies on that topic so I can't give like uh, the, the full disclosure on uh, on what we are we are working uh, of, of what our, our results I would say uh, that we are planning uh, actually uh, a paper for the next RS convention I guess on this topic so it's not fully uh, finished so I can't say it will be there for sure but that's an ongoing study and we'll be happy to report on that in one of the webinars. Well, thank you, Etienne. Um, so I, I really think there's a lot of great information to just remind people that uh, different configurations of subwoofers will have impacts on uh, uh, the efficiency in terms of the, the total energy and the efficiency in terms of distribution across the audience. But the one that seems to have the least impact is the one we all thought had the most, which is whether or not you fly them. Um, and if that's something we can learn that flying subs is, is, is a, a negligible uh, change compared to other choices. I, I think that's great. Um, so thank you, Etienne. Um, uh, thank I you hope Scott. I summarize. 
I hope I summarized that well. Uh, thank you to Alex, Dan, Oscar, Francois, Sergey for joining us, and of course, Guillaume for producing. Tomorrow we are here at the same time. We're going to talk all about Cara 2 um, and what Panflex brings to that product um, in terms of throw capability and coverage options. And then on Thursday, we have a great discussion about the sound design at the Hollywood Bowl, uh, which is a, a quite a famous venue just a few minutes from uh, our office here in uh, Westlake, California. Um, we're going to talk about the sound design and calibration of that. So please join us for that. Uh, there's a few interesting sub things in that as well. And hopefully soon we'll have more topics on subwoofers, uh, uh, as Etienne was telling you guys about. So thank you for joining us, everyone. Uh, please be safe, be healthy, and uh, take this time to uh, learn and grow your knowledge. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye.